Master in Management League for Uri Therapy Professionals. Welcome to our first in-person event uh, since the pandemic. Uh, we're excited to provide a partnership with IUDA and Immigration Services uh, um, and Social Services uh, provider here that is DC-based. Today we're going to do an overview, um, Know Your Rights Immigration Overview. We are excited to welcome uh, Beatrice Ortiz and Catherine Chen, who are staff attorneys at IUDA. Uh, they'll be providing some great uh, information uh, today, but also we will be having interpretive services um, uh, at the end of the program that will provide an overview in Amharic, um, in Ormanya, and in Tegrinya. And uh, if you have any questions, we also have uh, an attorney present that will be providing a one-on-one -on -one service. So we're excited to kick off this uh, um, event. Without further ado, uh, Beatrice, thank you, and uh, look forward to this. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I am very excited to be here. And uh, we're going to start with, with, with the presentation. This is going to be immigration law and some warnings, warnings for families. AYUDA, which is the organization that I work for, its, uh, its mission is to protect the rights of low-income immigrants who live in the metropolitan area and of the District of Columbia. We offer legal services social services to low-income in immigrants in the area, personal advice, domestic violence, se uh, sexual assault, and protections against family violence. So this presentation uh, doesn't, you cannot consider legal advice, it's just for you to know your rights. We really, really, um, need you to go to an attorney or if you are going to file any immigration benefits, a licensed attorney or a BIA accredited representative. So this is our agenda. We are going to start first with who is immigration, which agencies are on the immigration, under immigration, the immigration process, legal rights where you're interacting with the authorities, a safety plan that you can do, legal status options, and in the end, we're going to discuss naturalization. This is a test. Um, we are, I was hoping to answer the questions at the end of the presentation, but it's a preliminary test, so we start talking about immigration and uh, what it means of the, what it means immigration for different status that you can have in the United States. And you know some, and you have some knowledge of how immigration works. President Biden can change and independently establish new immigration laws. Is this true or false? False. It's false. Yes. <laughs> it's not something that the president can do. Uh, it's good. It's bad now because Biden is in favor of immigrants mostly. It was very, very good when Trump was the president because he, he could not change the immigration law. So anyway, um, approximately how many young people are protected on their DACA? DACA is a deferred action for childhood arrivals in the United States. We have 60,000, 400,000, 3 million, and 600,000. Anyone? 600,000. Yes, <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> ICE has the right to legally enter anyone's home without a court order. True or false? No, that's false. They cannot do that. That's one of the things that we're going to learn today. Who can represent you throughout my, uh, your immigration legal case? A lawyer, a notary a BIA accredited representative from a charity or organization, all of the above. A lawyer, A and C, an attorney, and a BIA accredited representative from a charity organization. So we're going to start with who is immigration? Immigration is um, basically agencies in the United States that has under, have under the law authority to give you or to deport you, um, but it's, it's agencies, it's not a court, 
It's not a federal court. It's not a state court. There are agencies that, under the law, has the, have the authority to change your status or to um, deport you from the United States. So we're going to start with the Department of Homeland Security. And under the Department of Homeland Security, we have USCIS, with, which is an agency that you have to submit documents so they say that you can have a temporary visa in the United States or you can become a resident in the United States. You're going to find that with USCIS. Then we have Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which is ICE. And ICE ha is, uh, has the authority of the prisons of the non-document persons in the United States. So they can detain you and they can put you in a prison. They can do raids. And then it's Customs and, and Borders Protection, which are in the airports and the borders. In terms of CDP, those are the persons that decide if you can enter or not enter in the United States when you are at the border. And uh, that, you know, that has many, uh, there's many ways that you can maybe uh, get with, with CDP. Most of the, of the persons don't, and they are detained, and they go then to ICE. So that's the agency that is in, it is in the borders. And then we have the Department of Justice, with the, the, the Board of Immigrant Appeals, and then the Immigration Court, is, with, which is Executive Office of Immigrant Review, with the Immigration Court. When you go to the Immigration Court, um, Basically, you are going to a court that it's going to determine if you can stay or you can or you have to leave because you're going to be deported from the United States. That's a decision that the immigration court is going to do. And the Board of Immigration Appeals is a court that you go when the immigration court makes a decision and you can appeal to the EIA. So those are connected, and they are both under the Department of Justice. Now we're going to talk about the immigration process. In the immigration process, you are either undocumented, which means that you entered with a visa, but the, your visa has expired, or that you entered without a visa. And that means you are documented in the United States. In USCIS, you can petition for many things. You can petition for uh, under a family petition, or an employment petition, or VAWA, or a U, or a T visa. We're going to discuss all of those today. So that's something that you do in USCIS. Remember the agencies that we talked about before? Well, the visa petitions most mostly you, you submit in USCIS. And then you go and be a resident of the United States, which is something that, that's what we want for someone that is undocumented in the United States, to get him or her to be a legal permanent resident of the United States. And then after, if you comply and you have all the requirements, then you can do the naturalization and be a citizen of the United States. What are your legal rights when you're interacting with the authorities? Or I'm going to tell you. Regardless of your immigration status, you have certain rights. You have the right to remain silent. The law only requires you to state your name. There's no legal obligation to disclose any other type of personal information. You do not have to tell anyone anything else than your name and that you are going to consult an attorney. This, the, the authorities are not going to pay for your lawyer. They, would, they, they offer that when you are under criminal investigation in immigration, even though you 
don't you don't get an attorney that is paid <coughs> by the government you do have the right to remain silent you do have the right to have an attorney with you you only have to pay for the attorney um, it's important that if you're going to give your name to the authorities, you give your real name, okay? And if an officer asks you something other than your name, you're going to tell the officer, I need to consult an attorney. That is something that is very important for you to understand because officers don't have to tell, that, don't have to tell you the truth. They can lie to you. So you have the right to remain silent and you have the right to consult an attorney before you make any other decision when you are detained by an officer. What if ICE knocks on your door? What if ICE goes to your home and says, hey, I'm here, you need to let me in? Well, guess what? you are not going to do that because ICE has to have a court order and a court order has to be signed by a judge. It needs to be translated to you if you don't know the language that the officer is talking to you. It needs to have the information that they uh, are going to search. It needs to have the name of the person that they are searching for. You are not going to open the door to get the search warrant. You are going to tell the officer to put the search warrant under the door. It is okay not to open the door to an ICE officer. That's your right. Remember the rights that we were talking about? But this is your right. You have the right not to let an ICE officer into your home if the officer doesn't have court order. Most of them don't. They just go and assume that they're gonna open the door. If for any reason you open the door, you are gonna tell the officer that he doesn't have permission to be there, okay? And you're gonna continue to tell the officer that he doesn't have permission to be there. Because without an a court order, the officer cannot do the, any detention in, in that house. The only exception that we have is that an ongoing crime, okay? If a robbery is going on in your home, the, officer can, the officers or police can enter. If there's a fire in your home, the police can enter. But this is an exception. Someone that knocks on your door, you are not going to let them in. This is important, and this happens. An ICE officer will never ask you for money. They are not gonna call you, call you and tell you, I have this person detained and I need a certain amount of money to, for you to get them out. That's not gonna happen, they don't do that. So you are gonna ask the officer, where is my family? Where is this person that you say you have? What should I do? Before you pay a bond, a judge or an ICE officer has to make a bond determination. So that's not automatically that you're going to, to have to pay someone that is calling you on the phone. So don't pay anything to, a, to someone that is saying to you that is an immigration officer. You have the right to request the name of any officer that you speak to because that's going to be important for your attorney, okay? If the officer did something that is illegal under the law, we want to know who he is, and you have the right to do that. If you're detained, they, have, they can take your fingerprints, they can confiscate your personal property, they can question you again, you can tell them your name and that you need to consult a lawyer. They are going to give you, or they're supposed to give you documents explaining the deportation process. 
and they're going to transfer you to an immigration detention center. It is important that if you are detained, you ask the officer, what is your A number? Why is this important? Because that's the way your family and your attorney is going to identif identify where you are. Because you are going to be transferred to an immigration detention center. There are many detention immigration centers in the United States. So with that, with that A number, they can know where you are. How are they going to do that? There's a locating, locating a detained person. There's a site of ICE that you put the A number and it tells you where the person is. If you don't know your A number and your family calls you and you don't have that A number, this biographical information that is here, that it says search by biographical information, is very complicated to use. Sometimes um, they don't have the actual name or last name of the person or the birth date. So it's very complicated if you don't have the A number. Remember, it's called the A number and it has nine digits. And it's going to be important for the person that is helping you to have that number. I'm going to explain to you how to do a safety plan. And this is because there are some people that are undocumented in the United States and work and have children and pay rent and have responsibilities in their life. And it's important that they do that. So if they are detained, for the time that they are detained, their family and their household can survive without them. That's why we recommend you do that. First of all, make copies of the most important documents. Birth, marriage, divorce certificates, copies of relief agreements and taxes. Then, save copies in a safe place. Tell someone that you trust where are the documents so the person can get to them. If you have children, make a power of attorney with an end date to, for, for someone that you trust, with someone that you trust. If you take medicine that you need doses on a daily basis, always have two or three of those doses with you. Because ICE does rates, rates in workplaces that they somehow know that have persons that do, do not have documents in the United States, and you're gonna be detained at your job, and you're not gonna be able to go back home. So it's important that you Go through this and determine which are important to you and which ones do you have to do. Again, make a family plan, a financial plan, take a power of attorney. The power of attorney is not forever, it has an expiration date, so it has to be someone that you trust. Okay, so. At the uh, beginning of the presentation, I told you that I was an immigration staff attorney at Ayuda. That means that I am an attorney that is authorized to practice immigration law in all of the United States. But not everybody is like that. So you have to be aware who are you consulting with your immigration case. Why? Because that person has your case in their hands. So it's important that he or she knows the immigration law. And it's important that she or he can represent you in an immigration court, for example. If he or she is not a lawyer in the United States, he or she cannot represent you in the in immigration court. She doesn't have the authority to do that. So what are you, what are you going to ask? You're going to ask where the attorney is authorized to practice law in the United States. It can be DC, it can be Texas, it can be Hawaii. <laughs> so it can be anywhere in the United States, but if she, she or he has to be licensed to practice law somewhere in the United States. A notary public in the United States, first of all, they are not attorneys. 
and they are not authorized under the law to take immigration cases. So that's very important. Some notaries do immigration work and they are not supposed to do any immigration work. A lawyer that is uh, licensed in a foreign country, I don't know, uh, Mexico, maybe he's authorized to practice law in Mexico, he's not authorized to practice law in the United States, which means that he or she cannot represent you at the immigration court and he or she can submit with you the USCIS documents, but is not going to have the knowledge that you need for he or she to submit the documents that you need for your visa, for your case where you are detained. So this is very important. An advisor or consultant in immigration law cannot represent you either. So that's important for you to know, and you can ask. You can go to this person's office and ask, where are you licensed? Where is your license? Can I see it? In which state it is? It's okay to ask. You are paying in most of the cases for the services, and in the cases that you are not paying because it's a pro bono representation, that lawyer has eth ethical um, obligations also, even if you are not paying. This is an example of what are notaries um, here and in Central America. A notary in the United States is authorized by the state to be a notary public. It doesn't have to be an attorney. It doesn't have to know anything of immigration law. And it cannot represent you in the court, in immigration court because to represent you in immigration court, he needs to be an attorney in the United States. And in Central America, most of the notaries are lawyers. In Puerto Rico, for example, notaries are lawyers, but they cannot represent you here in the United States. To avoid this legal fraud, it's very important for me that you understand this because um, you cannot be afraid to ask questions. You cannot be afraid to um, know your rights in terms of someone that is giving you a service. So don't be afraid to ask. Ask the lawyer where he or she is licensed. That's the first thing. Write the, down their contact information. You have no idea how many clients I see that tell me, yes, I have an attorney. I say, okay, what is her name or his name? Oh, I don't know. Um, he has the office at so and so. Okay, but what is his name? What is he doing? It's important that you write down the contact information of the person that is representing you. Be careful of attorneys that are going to ask you for money before they are going to submit anything. It is okay for an attorney to ask you for an advance, but it is, I will be careful of an attorney that says this case is cost this much and I need everything right now. So be careful. Get a second opinion. You can get a second opinion. You can. Go to another attorney and say, look, this is my situation, what do you recommend? Before you contact, you, you sign a contract with the first attorney, you can do that. Ask for a receipt for the payments that you are doing or have done. Ask for a copy of your documents. Guess what? The file is yours. Those are your, doc your documents. You can ask for your documents because they are yours. You can, they, the attorney maybe is going to uh, charge you a fee for the copies, but the copies are yours. You have to have them in your files. You can make a complaint against an attorney. You can go to the bar that that attorney is from. For instance, DC, you can go to the DC 
bar and make a complaint about the work that he or she is doing. That's okay. Sign a contract. If you need to ask the attorney, look, I don't understand what you're talking about. I don't understand the, the steps that I have to do to get my visa. Can you explain them to me again? The attorney needs to give you all the information that you need so you have a clear um, a clear uh, the clear steps for your case. It's okay if you ask a gazillion times. That's his job and you're paying for it. Don't trust any attorney that says, oh, don't worry, I know someone in USCIS. He's going to give you a visa because I have, that I have so many friends on USCIS that this is going to be just fine. That doesn't work like that. Attorneys should not do that, and if an attorney tells you that, I would go to another attorney. Attorneys don't do that, okay? So we're going to start with uh, some scenarios. Um, this one is the expedited removal. This is going to happen if you are detained either at the border or inside the United States, okay? This is not something that you submit, like USCIS, this is something that just happens. If you are inadmissible or undocumented or have an unexpired visa and ICE detains you for, or the police detains you, most, most of the persons that I know that have been here in the United States for a long time, they are detained because they, are, uh, they do not have a license and they drive. So they are detained by a police officer that is detaining them for nothing that is related to immigration. So that's, that may happen. It is important that you have proof that you have been here for more than two years. Because if you have been here for less than two years, they can do an expedited removal. And they, and they don't have to take you to the court. They can decide just to remove you. Okay? How to protect yourself from, from this? Keep the proof that you are, have been here for 14 years. The lease agreements, the taxes, any document that can help you. Carry that evidence. Or have it in your home with the copies of the important documents that I talked about earlier. Tell the officer that you are afraid to return to your home country. If you say that, they have to do a credible fear interview. So that gives you some leverage of on uh, being here or staying here in the United States. They can also reinstate an order of removal. Maybe you enter the United States and you were supposed to go to a hearing in the court and you didn't. And there's a removal order for uh, that you have. Or maybe you were already deported by the officer when you first entered. If this is, uh, if you have a deportation order, the order can be reinstated. And you don't, and you are not going to have the opportunity to go before a judge. You're not going to have the opportunity to go to the immigration judge because they already have a removal order for you. Again, how to protect yourself? You have to talk to an attorney. You have to see if there's any way that you can legalize your status. Sometimes the consult resolves the status of the person. My recommendation is that you don't wait for ICE to detain you and you get a consult before that. Because as you're gonna see, there are some visas that as of now are gonna protect you and are gonna give you some status in the United States, but if you don't go to an attorney and don't do the consult, you're, you're, maybe you have the opportunity to file for a visa and you have not done it. Tell them that you are afraid to return to your home country. They have to do a credible fear, in fear interview if you say that. These are, 
are over 21 can come to the United States, but they have to wait like eight years. Children that are uh, that their parents are American citizens and they are over 21 and are married can come, but they have to wait like 12 years. So it is. I have had clients that have been waiting for a long time for a visa, and then they are the visa is available and they can come. But it's important for you to know that this is not immediate, and uh, the expectations um, become high when you are an American citizen. So I understand, but unfortunately, the visa bulletin and the visa, the, the available visas are is not infinite, and it takes a long time. Is that uh, applicable from the application date? It's a, it's it's it depends on the on the on the date that you do the application. Yes, okay. yes. The priority date. This is a little technical, <laughs> but but the priority date depends on the, on the day you file the application, okay. and you are going to use that priority date with the visa bulletin to know when your visa is available. Especially even juvenile status. This also has has uh, is a visa that is not available immediately. It was once, but it, there has been so many submissions for it that now it takes like three years. But it's a it's an interesting process. In this process, um, a state court, a family state court, has to determine that the person. Uh, is well first it has to be underage and unmarried but the person cannot reunite with one or both parents because that parent or parents it can be one or both have abandoned him abused him or been neglected with him or her and this juvenile court which is a state court in dc or in maryland or in virginia is a family law court, uh, they make the determination of the mistreatment, the neglect, the abandonment of one or both parents. They have to make that determination in state court. And they also have to determine that it's, uh, it's not in the best interest of the child to return to his or her home country. After you have that judgment from the state court, you go to the USCIS. And you say to USCIS, look, I have here the judgment from the state court saying that this child, because it has to be under 21 or, or under 18, depending on the state, uh, has findings from the state court that comply with the special immigrant juvenile status. And USCIS makes a determination and approve that uh, visa. Again, it depends on the priority date, it depends on when you file the, the request in USCIS or the submission in USCIS. Right now, we are in 2022, I think they are processing visas from 2017, so it's more or less five years. That young man or girl is going to have a green card, but he cannot ask for his or her parents. Under the law, that person who has special, uh, has the visa under the special immigrant juvenile status cannot do a family petition for her or his parents because he was mistreated, neglected, or abandoned by one or both parents. I think there's something that is not right in this law because sometimes ch children are, have been mistreated, neglected, or abandoned by one parent and the, the kid cannot ask for the other one. But under the law, that's where we are right now. U visas. This is the one that I always say that some, that most people don't know they have the possibility of submitting uh, a U 
because they haven't gone, haven't gone to an attorney. So it's important that you consult with an attorney. You have been, have been a victim of a crime and you have cooperated with the authorities. It has to be certain crimes that the, the law says or indicates, but it gives you a pass to a green card. A U is a temporary visa, it's not an immigrant visa. It's a visa that you're gonna have for four years or less, but after four years, after three years of having a U, you can ask for an adjustment in the United States. Most of the inadmissibilities that have other visas, U visas, waive them. So if you have been here without documents, you can ask for a U visa and do the adjustment inside the United States. So it's important that you consult with the lawyer. Every case is different, but this is a path that, that takes a long time, but it works. VAWA requirements. You have to have been a victim of aggression or extreme cruelty by a US citizen. The aggressor could have been your parent, your spouse, or children, or you have been a victim of your children. In terms of marriage, you have to prove you had a bona fide marriage, or that you have been divorced for less than two years. And it's the same, you don't have to go outside to do a consular processing, you can do the adjustment here in the United States. Um, you have to have good, good model character, you cannot have a criminal history. T visa requirements. This visa requires severe trafficking. They use force, fraud, coercion, or sex trafficking to get you to the United States or here in the United States, okay? You must be here in the United States to ask for a T visa. You must carry out a reasonable request to assist the legal authorities. You have to tell the authorities that you're suffering the, the trafficking. You have to tell the the, the the attorney general that you have suffered the trafficking, but they are going to decide if they pursue a criminal case against the person that is doing the trafficking, and if they don't, you still have the possibility of submitting a T. So that doesn't mean that you're not, if they decide not to charge, that doesn't mean you're not gonna have your visa. You just have to cover it with the authority. You have to prove that you will face extreme and severe difficulties if you are deported. So that's something that the person has to prove also. Asylum requirements. This is mainly when you are, it, it applies in immigration court, but it's mainly when you are submitting an asylum application to the USCIS, which is the asylum office in the United States. You are going to tell the asylum office that you cannot return to your home country because of your race, religion, nationality, or you belonging to a particular social group or political opinion. You have to prove that you have been persecuted in the past, and you have to prove that you have a well-founded fear of being persecuted in the future, okay? Asylum cases are discretionary. So uh, a judge or an officer can decide against an asylum even though you have a case of asylum because they are discretionary, okay? So if you have any visa that you can submit and you have an asylum case, my recommendation is that you submit and you do both things, okay? It is important that you need to file the asylum in the first year that you are here in the United States. There are some exceptions, but that's what the law says. These are uh, protections that don't give you status, 
but they protect you from being deported from the United States. We are talking about temporary protected status, DACA. A temporary protected status is something that the president decides. It is, he, he, he decides it um, uh, through the, um, the agencies that we talked before, but it doesn't give you, it gives you the status of being legal in the United States, but it doesn't give you a residence. If you have TPS, unless you get married with someone that is a U.S. citizen or a legal, uh, legal permanent resident, you are not, you are gonna have just TPS, okay? And these are the countries that have TPS right now. Also, you have to have been here in the United States when the TPS was issued. So there are many people here from El Salvador, but for TPS, you have to have been here before 2001, because that temporary protected status was because of a hurricane that happened in El Salvador, and they have been renewing it through the years. Okay, but they can um, say that they are not going to include El Salvador in the temporary protected status at any time. So that's something that um, it gives you the opportunity to stay here and work here and have a work permit, but it doesn't give you a path to a residence. DACA. These are the requirements of DACA. Um, right now, People that have DACA can renew it, but they cannot submit a new application, even if they comply with all the requirements, because a judge, I think it was in Texas, decided that like a couple of months ago, I don't remember the date. Um, you can file it, but USCIS cannot make a decision on that DACA. Because, um, so, I'm not gonna discuss the requirements. If the person has DACA, can renew it if, it do, if he or she doesn't have any criminal convictions. And it's important, criminal, conviction, criminal convictions under immigration law are not necessarily the same as in the states. You can have three misdemeanors in Virginia and you don't qualify for DACA. So you have to go to an attorney so the attorney can do the assessment of what you have and decides if you are, uh, are able to submit a ILAC. And finally, naturalization. Um, before I do this, uh, I want to make an example of how you get to this naturalization through a visa. If you have a U visa, a U visa is a temporary visa. It's issued for four, three or four years. After, right now, U visas are taking nine years. So, after you go through everything for a U visa, and you have your U, you have to wait three years of living continuously in the United States to ask for an adjustment and have a green card. The same thing goes to T visas. T visas are issued for four years or three, depending. After you have been here for three years living continually, you can file for the adjustment. In the case of the T visa, if the Attorney General decides that you have been cooperating with the investigation and the investigation is over, he or she can write you a letter and you can file for the adjustment before the three years. If you were, um, if you had a family petition and you entered the United States through consular processing because you, your mother was a legal resident or a citizen or your father, you're gonna have your green card immediately after you get to the United States, but you have to wait five years to apply for naturalization, okay? So it depends on the visa that you have, the time that you have to wait to submit an adjustment or to apply for citizenship. 
In the case of naturalization, you have to wait five years after you are a permanent resident, or three if you are married to a US citizen. You have to have good moral char character throughout three or five years, no criminal convictions. There are people that cannot uh, file for naturalization and they just have their green card. Okay? You need to approve a reading and writing and speaking test in English. There are some exceptions. Age is one. The time that you have been a legal uh, permanent resident here in the United States is another. There are local organizations that offer free affordable English classes. This is very important. I have been in interviews for naturalization that the only, the only thing that the person didn't pass is the English test. So, and that's the end of our, my presentation. If you have any questions, And if the person has a f a can, can file for a family petition, if have, it has any family in the United States that is a US citizen or a legal permanent resident. But every case is different. That's why I always recommend a consult. And you have, this is not there, but this is my uh, <laughs> assessment. You have to go to an attorney that knows immigration. Not all attorneys know immigration law. This is very specific. This, this law, immigration law changes every day. So you have to be aware that first you need a consult, but you need a consult with a good person, because, or a good attorney, or a person that you know that has the knowledge. Because I have had clients that have had attorneys that they don't submit the right applications, or they submit the application and they don't do the work to after the application is filed. So, but the time that the person has been in here in the United States is not necessarily um, something that it's bad. If the person has the opportunity to file for any of the visas, it doesn't matter if he or she is here for 20 years. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Please. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I have a friend of mine who has uh, his, uh, his child mm -hmm. a dog in, in Eritrea. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the thing is, she was not able to come out of Eritrea because of the uh, situation that there is a, a permanent uh, uh, military service for, for the mm -hmm. for young people. And, um, so uh, she expired, I mean, her, her, her possibility of getting, because her father is a, an American citizen, mm -hmm. and uh, she had the right, I mean, to, to, to join him. Okay. And uh, she was protected by the TPS mm -hmm. as well. And uh, so uh, she expired, I mean, her, uh, her possibility of uh, coming to the United States, and the USCIS uh, decided that She's no longer, I mean, uh, well, eligible. Well, from the fact that you are telling me, she can file another family petition. She, she can file another. If she has a father that is in the citizen, okay. yes. Okay. The problem is that she, if she is um, older than 21, she's yeah. going to have to wait a long time. OK, is that that's famous 12 years, 8, eight years, how much? Yeah. If she's not married, like, 8 years. Uh, and, uh, and how if she's married uh, with the child? She's, with, she's married with the child, right? If his, her father is a US citizen, she can file, mm -hmm. but she's going to have to wait a long time. But look. A uh, long time meaning, I mean, from to, is there any? It's 12 years right now. Years. Okay. Yeah. This is something that um, I want to make clear. Yeah. And. Uh, that I tell all my clients, even if they have a, a, a sibling that is a US citizen, which takes 20, is something. If you don't file it, you're not going to have it. You don't know what's going to happen. If you are here and you are detained, 
and you have something filed with USCIS. That's something, that's something that can, in so, at some point, work for you to come to the United States or work for you to stay in the United States. I have had clients with U visas for seven years that have been in the United States since 1998. And now he has a visa and now he has a work permit. Why? Because he filed a long time ago. But it's, it gives you something and it's better to file something that don't do anything because it's going to take a long time. The times with immigration are, it, do, the, it doesn't make sense. I get it. I, I work with that all the time, every day of my life. But um, the time is going to be more if you don't file as soon as possible. Yes? Um, for family petitions, can you speak to are there priorities for um, half siblings or, or is it just if their sibling is what it is and you mm -hmm. do a DNA test? Like, are there timelines that change? No. But it, they take a long time. Siblings is the hardest. I haven't seen any, any petitions for American citizens of their siblings coming to the United States. I have seen uh, unmarried uh, ch child, which is over 21, and I have done consular processing and the person enters the United States and has a green card. I have, I have cases like that right now. Um, I have had U visas that take a long time also. Uh, it's important that the T doesn't have to wait anything. The T visa is immediate. It doesn't have waiting time. You don't have to wait a long time. Um, but yes, uh, it, they take time. But again, it's better to have something filed than to not have anything. And I guess I... Uh, I mentioned it before. These are your rights. You have a right to file these things. They are there for a reason. U visas are there because um, legislators didn't want people to be victims of a crime and not going to the police. So that's why they created U visas. So these are visas that are there for the people that suffer or have the requirements for something. So it, the only, well, you have to wait, you have to file and you have to wait. <laughs> and you have to go to someone that has the knowledge. And if you have someone, an attorney or an notario that is not doing, doing a good work, we have Arayuda um, Project End that can help you. Um, and you can go to a bar of the state and make a complaint. You can't do that. Immigrants, I don't know why, but they don't do those things. Um, but it's important that they do because they, they are entitled to a good service and a good work for them. So, any other questions? The government has to provide some sort of free representation, but not for immigration, correct? Are there any resources that a person can use, say if they don't have you know, access to, to pay a quality immigration lawyer? Um, the nonprofit organizations, um, are you guys one of them? Um, the problem with immigration is that some of the rights of the Constitution apply to them. I mean, in silent, it applies, applies to immigrants, but the right, the right to an attorney paid by the government doesn't. So there are more non-profit organizations, there are less non-profit organizations than immigrants that need them here in the United States, um, and that's a problem. But that's where we are. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I'm not sure if you already said this, but if you could reiterate the immigration is such a sensitive topic, so could you speak to the relationship between the, co the person who's consulting and the person who's coming to the consult for mm -hmm. questions like the confidentiality or like protection? Yeah. 
there's protections for the person that is consulting. Confidentiality is one of them. Again, the file is yours. You can ask for a copy of the file. You can ask for a the file. You can um, get a second opinion. You need to um, understand the contract of the retainer, retainer that you are signing. You can ask an attorney to translate the contract. You can do that. And if you think the attorney is not going, doing a good job, attorneys are not doc doctors. We have ethical obligations with our clients. Unfortunately, immigrate, I've been a lawyer for a long time. I have not been doing immigration for that long time. <laughs> I have been doing immigration for just five years. But I have seen that in this practice, clients don't do complaints. They get bad attorneys that don't do a good job, that they pay a lot of money because immigrants want to stay here and want to have documents in the United States and want to have visas. But for some reason, they don't go to the bar associations and, and make a complaint. I don't know why. But you have that right. And you have to ensure that you understand the process. The process in immigration is very long, as you've heard me say. And it has steps. So you have to understand your case. And you can ask your attorney a gazillion times, and your attorney has to explain it to you. It's your case. It's the most important thing in your life. So you can ask again and again and again. It doesn't matter. You can do that. Also, if you call your attorney and your attorney doesn't return your call in a, man in, in a sensible time, that's not right. An attorney has to answer the phone. He or she has to say to you, what is the status of your case? Sometimes it's, well, it's submitted, we're waiting. But you have the right to that call. There are attorneys in immigration and in, uh, in other areas, but we're talking in immigration right now, um, that don't answer the phone. Or say, I don't have time for this right now. Or talk to my paralegal. No, you need to speak to your attorney. Again, you have rights. And those rights include that you um, have the information of your case. That's very important. And you are not bothering anyone. Not, uh, it's not an inconvenience for the attorney. That's their job. And even if you are receiving a pro bono representation, that's their job. That's something ethically that they have to do. Any other questions? An asylum office, but you could also file it in the court. What's the difference? In okay. Um, there's two types of asylums. Um, but I didn't include that here because that's a little tricky, but um, there's an affirmative asylum, which is filed in the asylum office. And there's the asylum that you submitted in the court. The difference is, I cannot talk about my clients, but uh, I have a client here that came to the United States because she was being persecuted in her home country. But she entered with a tourist visa. She wasn't detained. So she's here for six months legally. She can't file for an asylum if she was persecuted because of her political opinion. But you cannot, cannot go to the immigration court I say, and say, I want to file for asylum. You go to the asylum office and uh, you can do that. You send it actually to USCIS and they, they send it to the asylum office. So that's an affirmative asylum. And you have to file it before a year that you have been here in the United States. In the immigration court, you are detained when you enter. Or you are detained after because you were somewhere that there was an officer and he detained you. So there, you file the asylum. But it's a defensive asylum, not an affirmative asylum. The requirements are the same. The difference is if you go to the asylum office first, 
or you, if you file it with USCIS and they transfer it to the US to you to the asylum office, you have two shots at the hearing. You are going to go to the officer, and if the officer denies it, he's going to refer it to the immigration court, and you can see your asylum case again. So that's the difference between an affirmative and an offensive. Um, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? That, that has, again, uh, my recommendation always with clients, every case is different. So go to an attorney, go to an attorney that does immigration law, make sure that you understand your case. You're not, I don't, uh, again, I don't know why, but you're not bothering your attorney with questions. That's our job, that's what we do. If an attorney doesn't answer your questions, look for another attorney. There are many immigration <laughs> attorneys, so. Or go to a non-profit, or, but make sure that you understand your case, that you understand your steps, that you have clear what you have to do, that your attorney is in the same page with you, that you are paying and you are receiving the service that you are supposed to be. Hard. Um, that's always been a complex process, and even more so in recent years. Are there any unique resources that you would recommend outside of this that people tap into for immigration related to employment, or any set of best practices? I think what you said, a lot of it is applicable, but yeah, any employment is complicated. I don't. I, yeah. There, there's an example. I don't know anything about immigration employment. Wow. <laughs> Uh, if you if you tell me I need an employment visa, I'm going to refer you to another attorney. <laughs> because I don't know what you're talking about, really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know that the, the visa volatile in, in terms of employment is current, which is good, which means that the employers and employees can get their, their visa through the employment-based visas. Yeah. Um, other than that, I haven't had the opportunity to work with uh, employee. Make sure that your attorney knows what your what your visa is for. We at Ayuda don't don't do employment visas. Um, maybe one day we'll, we we will, but we don't right now. So that's an important uh, thing. Uh, make sure that the person that you are contracting with knows what he or she is doing. And you're going to know that because you're going to ask questions, <laughs> a lot of them. <laughs> um, but yeah. So I am going to uh, transfer the microphone to Catherine because she has information about Project N and the next um, uh, clinic that we have. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we have flyers in the front here that you can take, um, but the first one is for our brief immigration and advice referrals. These are monthly clinics that Ayuda does, and right now they're all still remote. And so our next one is actually in August. We're skipping July. And so um, how this works is on one Friday, you call in between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., though I really recommend you call in early because the spots fill out fast. And then you kind of give your information. Our intake specialist takes your information. And then on the following Friday, you will um, be ready at a given time slot to receive a phone call from an attorney. And these are one-on-one -on -one consultations where you can ask your immigration questions. And it's just a, just a consultation, but um, they can give you kind of pointers and next steps. And if you do qualify for one of these forms of relief, then, um, then you, they can let you know. And um, again, as Faye said, we don't do uh, employment immigration, so those are that's the only set of questions we can't really answer. But if it's uh, family related or what we call humanitarian, so all these other forms of relief, we can answer that. So the next one is August 19th when you would call in to get a time slot. Again, that's between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., but I recommend calling as early as possible, as close to 10 a.m. as possible. And then the consults will be scheduled for August 26th. And then the second flyer 
The second consult we have is for um, Project End. As Beatrice said, um, you know, there are a lot of folks out there who might go by the name of notary or notario or immigration cons consultant or case writer is another one we've heard. And um, then if uh, you or someone you know has consulted with them, paid for legal advice, or they filed a form for you, um, we have a project called Project N that you can do a consult with and we can help you kind of see what happened with your immigration case. If there's, if they, if you know, if somebody else messed it up, is there a way to get it back right on track? Um, if you want to file a complaint against that person, that's something we can help with. And so um, the, you can, at the bottom of the flyer, there's a telephone number and also an email address, and that will do kind of more in-depth consult. Um, but the phone number is 202-552-3604, and the email is end, E-N-D, at iuda, A-Y-U-D-A, dot com. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Beatrice. That was a very informative conversation. We also, after this, have an attorney, um, including, of course, these two great attorneys that will be able to provide one-on-one -on -one consulting. So for anyone that wants to, to stay and have follow-up questions, they'll be here for a few minutes. Thank you again, and uh, we look forward to partnering with Aida uh, more in the future. That's what the loss is. These are uh, protections that don't give you status, but they protect you from being deported from the United States. We are talking about temporary protected status, DACA. A temporary protected status is something that the president decides, it is, she, he, he decides it, um, uh, through the um, the agencies that we talked before, but it doesn't give you it gives you the status of being legal in the United States, but it doesn't give you a residence. If you have TPS, unless you get married with someone that is a U.S. citizen or a legal, uh, legal permanent resident, you are not you are going to have just TPS. Okay. And these are the countries that have TPS right now. Also, you have to have been here in the United States when the TPS was issued. So there are many people here from El Salvador, but for TPS, you have to have been here before. And they have been renewing it through the years. Okay, but they can um, say that they are not going to include El Salvador in the temporary protected status at any time. So that's something that um, it gives you the opportunity to stay here and work here and have a work permit, but it doesn't give you a path to a residence. DACA. These are the requirements of DACA. Um, right now, people that have DACA can renew it but they cannot submit a new application, even if they comply with all the requirements, because the judge, I think it was in Texas, decided that like a couple of months ago, I don't remember the date. Um, you can file it, but USCIS cannot make a decision on that DACA. Because, um, so I'm not gonna, discuss the requirements. If the person has DACA, can renew it if, it do, if he or she doesn't have any criminal convictions. And it's important, criminal, condition, criminal convictions under immigration law are not necessarily the same as in the states. You can have three misdemeanors in Virginia and you don't qualify for DACA. So you have to go to an attorney so the attorney can do the assessment of what you have and decides if you are, uh, are able to submit a, a DACA. And finally, naturalization. Um, before I do this, uh, I want to make an example of how you get to this naturalization through a visa. If you have a U visa, your visa is a temporary visa. It's issued for four, three or four years. 
after right now U visas are taking nine years so after you go through everything for a U visa and you have your U you have to wait three years of living continuously in the United States to ask for an adjustment and have a green card the same thing goes to T visas T visas are issued for four years or three depending after you have been here for three years living continually, you can file for the adjustment. In the case of the T visa, if the Attorney General decides that you have been cooperating with the investigation and the investigation is over, he or she can write you a letter and you can file for the adjustment before the three years. If you were um, if you had a family petition and you enter the United States through consular processing because you, your mother was a legal resident or a citizen or your father, you're going to have your green card immediately after you get to the United States, but you have to wait five years to apply for naturalization. Okay? So it depends on the visa that you have, the time that you have to wait to submit an adjustment or to apply for citizenship. In the case of naturalization, you have to wait five years after you are a permanent resident or three if you are married to a US citizen. You have to have good moral character throughout three or five years, no criminal convictions. There are people that cannot uh, file for naturalization and they just have their green card. Okay. You need to approve a reading and writing and speaking test in English. There are some exceptions. Age is one. The time that you have been a legal uh, permanent resident here in the United States is another. There are local organizations that offer free affordable English classes. This is very important. I have been in interviews for naturalization that the only, the only thing that the person didn't pass is the English test. So, here in the United States for 20 years, it doesn't matter. And if the person has a, a can, can file for a family petition, if have and has any family in the United States that is a US citizen or a legal permanent resident. But every case is different. That's why I always recommend a consult. And you have, this is not there, but this is my uh, <laughs> assessment. You yeah. have to go to an attorney that knows immigration law. Not, not all attorneys know immigration law. This is very specific. This, this law, immigration law changes every day. So you have to be aware that first you need a consult, but you need a consult with a good person, because, or a good attorney, or a person that you know that has the knowledge. Because I have had clients that have had attorneys that they don't submit the right applications, or they submit the application and they don't do the work to after the application is filed. So, but the time that the person has been here in the United States is not necessarily um, something that is bad. If the person has the opportunity to file for any of the visas, it doesn't matter if he or she is here for 20 years. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, yes. It's fine. It's fine. Coming to the United States, uh, the USCIS uh, decided that she's no longer in the uh, well, From the fact that you are telling me, she can file another family petition. Maybe she, she can file. If she has a father that is a US she citizen, she yes. Okay. The problem is that she, if she's um, older than 21, she's yeah. going to have to wait a long time. Okay, is that that's famous 12 years, like 8 years? You know, how much yeah. You know? If she's not married, like eight years. No, and, and how about if she's married uh, with their child? She's, with, she's married with their child, right? If his, her father is a US citizen, it's something. If you don't file it, you're not going to have it. You don't know what's going to happen. 
If you are here and you are detained and you have something filed with USCIS, that's something, that's something that can in so, at some point work for you to come to the United States or work for you to stay in the United States. I have had clients with U visas for seven years that have been in the United States since 1998. And now he has a visa and now he has a work permit. Why? Because he filed a long time ago. But it's, it gives you something and it's better to file something that don't do anything because it's going to take a long time. The times with immigration are, it, do, the, it doesn't make sense. I get it. I, I work with that all the time, every day of my life. But um, the time is going to be more if you don't file as soon as possible. Yes? Um, for family visitors and people mm -hmm. with DNA tests, like, are there timelines that change? Okay. No. Okay. But it, they take uh, petitions for American citizens of their siblings coming to the United States. I have seen. Uh, unmarried uh, ch child, which is over 21, and I have done consular processing. Some the person enters the United States and has a green card. I have I have cases like that right now. Um, I have had U visas that take a long time. Also, uh, it's important that the T doesn't have to wait anything. The T visa is in India. It doesn't have waiting time. You don't have to wait a long time. Um, but yes, uh, it, they take time. But again, it's better to have something filed than to not have anything. And I guess I, uh, I mentioned it before. These are your rights. You have a right to file these things. They are there for a reason. U visas are there because um, legislat legislators didn't want people to be victims of a crime and not going to the police. So that's why they created U visas. So these are visas that are there for the people that suffer or have the requirements for something. So it, the only, well, you have to wait, you have to file and you have to wait. <laughs> and you have to go to someone that has the knowledge. And if you have someone, an attorney, or an notario that is not doing, doing a good work. We have Arayuda, um, Project End, that can help you. Um, and you can go to a bar of the state and make a complaint. You can do that. Immigrants, I don't know why, but they don't do those things. Um, but it's important that they do because they they are entitled to a good service and a good work for them. So, any other questions? Uh, you mentioned for most other cases, the government has to provide some sort of free representation, but not for immigration, correct? Are there any resources that a person can use, say if they don't have you know, access to, to pay a quality immigration lawyer? Um, the nonprofit organizations, um, are you guys one of them? The problem with immigration is that some of the rights of the Constitution apply to them, but some don't. And that's one of the ones that don't apply to the immigrants. So due process applies to immigrants. Um, the right to see women in silence applies, applies to immigrants. But the right, the right to an attorney paid by the government does. So there are more non-profit organizations, there are less non-profit organizations than immigrants that need them here in the United States. Um, and that's a problem. But that's where we're at. Any other questions? Yes. I'm not sure if you've already said this. I've not been doing immigration for that long time. <laughs> I have been doing immigration for just five years. But I have seen the 
that in this practice, clients don't do complaints. They get bad attorneys that don't do a good job, that they pay a lot of money because immigrants want to stay here and want to have documents in the United States and want to have visas. But for some reason, they don't go to the bar associations and, and make a complaint. I don't know why. But you have that right. And you have to ensure that you understand the process. The process in immigration is very long, as you've heard me say. And it has steps. So you have to understand your case. And you can ask your attorney a gazillion times, and your attorney has to explain it to you. It's your case. It's the most important thing in your life. So you can ask again and again and again. It doesn't matter. You can do that. Also, if you call your attorney and your attorney doesn't return your call in a, man in, in a sensible time, that's not right. An attorney has to answer the phone. He or she has to say to you, what is the status of your case? Sometimes it's, well, it's a minute, we're waiting. But you have the right to that call. There are attorneys in immigration and in, in other areas, but you're talking about immigration right now, um, that don't answer the phone. Or say, I don't have time for this right now. Or talk to my paralegal. No, you need to speak to your attorney. Again, you have rights, and those rights include that you um, have the information of your case. That's very important. And you are not bothering anyone. Not, uh, it's not an inconvenience for the attorney. That's their job. And even if you are receiving a pro bono representation, that's their job. That's something ethically that they have to do. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I have a list. On the topic of asylum, yes. you mentioned there's an asylum office, but you could also file it in the court. What's the difference? In okay, um, there's two types of asylums. Um, I didn't include it here because that's a little tricky, but um, there's an affirmative asylum, which is filed in the asylum office, and there's the asylum that you submitted in the court. The difference is, for instance, uh, I have a client that came here, this is an example, I cannot talk about my clients, but uh, I have a client here that came to the United States because she was being persecuted in her own country, but she entered with a tourist visa. She wasn't detained. So she's here for six months, legally. She can fight for an asylum if she was persecuted because of her political opinion. But you cannot, cannot go to the immigration court and say, and say, I want to fight for asylum. You go to the asylum office and uh, you can do that. You send that actually to USCIS and they, they send it to the asylum office. So that's an affirmative asylum and you have to fight it before a year that you have been here in the United States. In the immigration court, you are detained when you enter, or you are detained after because you were somewhere that there was an officer and he detained you. So there, you file the asylum, but it's a defensive asylum, not an affirmative asylum. The requirements are the same. The difference is, if you go to the asylum office first, or you, if you file it with USCIS and they transfer it to the US to you to the asylum office, you have two shots at the hearing. You are going to go to the officer, and if the officer denies it, he's going to refer it to the immigration court, and you can see your asylum case again. So that's the difference between an affirmative and a defensive. Um, yeah. Any other questions? That, that has, again, uh, my recommendation always with clients, every case is different. So go to an attorney, go to an attorney that does immigration law, make sure that you understand your case. 
you're not, I don't, uh, again, I don't know why, but you're not bothering your attorneys with questions. That's our job, that's what we do. If an attorney doesn't answer your questions, look for another attorney. There are many immigrants <laughs> attorneys, so. Or go to a nonprofit, or, but make sure that you understand your case, that you understand your steps, that you have clear what you have to do, that your attorney is in the same page with you, that you are paying and you are receiving the service that you are supposed to be. Any other questions? Yes. For immigration related to employment, so H-1B green mm -hmm. card, um, that's always been a complex process and even more so in recent years. Are there any unique resources that you would recommend outside of this that people tap into for immigration related to employment or any set of best practices? I think what you said, a lot of it is applicable, but yeah. any- Employment is complicated. I don't, I, yeah. There, there's an example. I don't know anything about immigration employment. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you, if you tell me I need an employment visa, I'm gonna refer you to another attorney <laughs> because I don't know what you're talking about, really. Yeah. Uh, I know that the the visa bulletin in in terms of employment is current, which is good, which means that the employers and employees can get their their visa through the employment-based visas. Um, other than that, I haven't had the opportunity to work with uh, employment visas. I have uh, had um, courses because I want to learn. Yeah. But again, make sure that your attorney knows what your, talk, what your visa is for. We at Ayuda don't, don't do employment visas. Um, Maybe one thing we will, we will, but we don't right now. So that's an important uh, thing. Uh, make sure that the person that you are contracting with knows what he or she is doing. And you're going to know that because you're going to ask questions, <laughs> a lot of them. <laughs> um, but yeah. So I am going to uh, transfer the microphone to Catherine because she has information about Project N and the next um, uh, clinic that we have. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Um, so we have flyers in the front here that you can take, um, but the first one is for our brief immigration and advice referrals. These are monthly clinics that IUDA does and right now they're all still removed. And so our next one is actually in August. We're skipping July. And so um, how this works is on one fri Friday you call in between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. though I really recommend you call in early because the spots fill out fast. And then you kind of give your information. Our intake specialist takes your information. And then on the following Friday, you will um, be ready at a given time slot to receive a phone call from an attorney. And these are one-on-one -on -one consultations where you can ask your immigration questions. And it's just a just a consultation, but um, they can the relief. Then um, then they can let you know. And um, again, as we said, we don't do uh, employment immigration, so those are that's the only set of questions we can't really answer. But if it's uh, family related or what we call humanitarian, so all these other forms of relief, we can answer that. So the next one is August 19th, when you would call in to get a time slot. Again, that's between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., but I recommend calling as early as possible, as close to 10 a.m. as possible. And then the consults will be scheduled for August 26th. And then the second flyer, the second consult we have is for um, Project End. As Beatrice said, um, you know, there are a lot of folks out there who might go by the name of notary or notario or immigration cons consultant or case writer is another one we've heard. And um, it's, then if uh, you or someone you know has consulted with them, paid for legal advice, or they filed a form for you, 
um, we have a project called Project N that you can do a consult with and we can help you kind of see what happened with your immigration case. If there's, if, it, if you know, if somebody else messed it up, is there a way to get it back right on track? Um, if you want to file a complaint against that person, that's something we can help with. And so um, the, you can, at the bottom of the flyer, there's a telephone number and also an email address, and that will do kind of a more in-depth consult. Um, the phone number is 202-552-3604, and the email is end, E-N-D, at ayuda, A-Y-U-D-A, dot com. Thank you.